everyone, welcome to today's LACNITS webinar. I'm Lindsay Judevine, the Director of Communications for LACNITS. And I'm Lisa Yen, I'm the Director of Programs and Outreach for LACNITS. Before we get started, I'd like to take a second to thank Rich at TVP Live for making today's webinar and high quality production possible. We'd also like to thank our supporters, Ipsen, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Novartis, and Tercera Therapeutics. Be sure you're following LACNITS on social media to stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at LACNITS. And before I pass it off to Lisa, I'd like to remind our viewers that these webinars are done for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Please talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We all have our own opinions and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACNITS. And now I'll pass it off to you, Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. LACNITS is a program by GeneratePossibility.org, a registered nonprofit, and it stands for the Los Angeles Carcinoid Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. Our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and support for all people impacted by this uncommon disease that used to be called carcinoid, an old term meaning cancer-like. You'll often hear us say neuroendocrine cancer because it's a patient-friendly way to say the official medical term, neuroendocrine neoplasm, an umbrella term for both neuroendocrine tumor, or NET, and neuroendocrine carcinoma, or NEC. We also say neuroendocrine cancer because we understand NET is a type of cancer and not cancer-like or benign as previously thought. While you often see Lindsay and I leading the meetings and programs, we are led by a team, which includes our executive director and board member, Kavya Velikabudi, board member, Donna Gavin, who's also the sister of LACNIT's founder and executive director, Emeritus Giovanna Joyce and Basie. And our board also includes Mary Dunlevy, who has been living and thriving with NET for over 17 years. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gary Ulaner, who joins us from Southern California. Dr. Gary Ulaner is the James and Pamela Muzzy Endowed Chair of Molecular Imaging and Therapy at the Hogue Family Cancer Institute in Irvine, California. He is also a professor of radiology and translational genomics at the Keck School of Medicine in the University of Southern California. Dr. Ulaner was previously with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he trained under NET expert Dr. Lisa Baudet, who is a leader in the field of radioligand therapy, or PRRT. Dual board certified in radiology and nuclear medicine, Dr. Ulaner is a nationally recognized expert in the use of targeted imaging to help direct focused cancer therapies. Dr. Ulaner completed his medical degree and PhD in cancer biology at the Stanford University School of Medicine, an internship at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and his radiology and nuclear medicine residencies at the University of Southern California. You may have heard Dr. Ulaner on a recent LACNIS podcast discussing net imaging. He has a way of explaining things in an easy to understand way that our community has really appreciated. We're excited to have him join us today to discuss the important topic, net imaging, demystifying scans and reports. Welcome, Dr. Ulaner. Hi, my name is Gary Ulaner, and I am the James and Pamela Muzzy Endowed Chair of Molecular Imaging and Therapy at the Hogue Family Cancer Institute. Uh, welcome today. Uh, to our discussion of radiology and radiology reports for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. I like to uh, say that uh, I like teaching radiology beginning at an early age. Uh, this is my son, Ilya, and my daughter, Annabelle, uh, helping me teach a molecular imaging and therapy radiology course. A couple years ago, this was before uh, the era of COVID, and uh, just so that you can see them, uh, how they look today. I would say one of the major problems with medical imaging is that current imaging methods may not be able to see small tumors. We have a graphic describing what 
a one millimeter, two millimeter, approximately five millimeter, up to about five centimeter objects tend to look like. And current imaging technologies like CT scans, which people are becoming very familiar with, often can't see tumors when they're below one centimeter or 10 millimeter in size. Now, by the time a tumor is one centimeter in size, it's composed of more than 100 million cells. That's 100 million chances to metastasize, 100 million chances to develop a mutation that makes it resistant to therapy. So what we really want to do is be able to detect a tumor when it's a single cell and then eradicate it. Now, our technology is unfortunately not that good. But with molecular imaging and therapy, we can move that goal stick of being able to detect tumors that are one centimeter in size down to where we can detect tumors when they're only one or two millimeters in size. For example, the CT scan on the right, but the white areas are your bones. The black area, your lungs, and in the middle, that's what we call the mediastinum, the heart, and the great vessels. Somewhere in this picture, there is a tumor. Now, the best radiologist on the planet can't find that tumor because the CT scan doesn't see it. But with techniques like molecular imaging and therapy, even my son and daughter can now find that bright red spot that's labeled with an arrow that shows a site of malignancy in a bone. And this is the remarkable thing about molecular imaging and therapy. It takes our ability to detect the tumors that we were previously able to detect and detect them when they're one one hundredth or one tenth the size. This is how molecular imaging and therapy works. I like to describe this as a key fitting into a lock. You can start with, on the right side, a cancer cell. And that cancer cell expresses different molecules which act as targets, like locks. We can design keys that fit into those targets, as I said, like a key fitting into a lock. That's the binding agent that hits the target. And then we can link to that key a radioisotope. If that radioisotope emits a small amount of radiation, we've built a key that allows us to image cancer. And we'll also talk a little bit about keys that contain radioisotopes that emit a lot of radiation that can try and kill a cancer cell. And that is the basis of molecular imaging and molecular therapy. So today, I'm going to talk about common radiology exams for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, starting with anatomic imaging, like computerized tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, and then moving to nuclear imaging scans, like bone scans and positron emission tomography. And for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, molecular imaging is currently the dotatate scans, 68 gallium dotatate and 64 copper dotatate. And I'll come back to why I've crossed out the octreotide scan, which is an older scan, which I don't think should be performed anymore. Let's start with anatomic imaging, like computerized tomography. CT scans, if you've seen them before, are able to visualize the anatomy based on how dense something is. Your bones are denser than your soft tissues, like your liver, and your lungs are the least dense of any of these organs. And this allows us to see the different structures. Now on the left, I have a image of a liver and spleen. And the liver you can see has areas that have lower, um, what we call density or attenuation. They are darker than the rest of the liver. That is unfortunately tumor uh, within the liver. So the uh, normal liver is a higher, whiter color, and the darker areas in the liver are unfortunately tumor. We can change what we call the window of a CT scan to better see the bones or the lungs. In the middle, you see an image of the spine, which has been windowed to best depict the bones. Now the bones typically have a lighter, not white, appearance in the middle. The area of the bones that looks very white, which is most of the spine, again, is abnormal bone in a patient with a bony malignancy. And then on the right image, we see a CT image windowed for the lung, 
The two lungs look very dark, and in the lung on the right side of the image, uh, there is a roundish nodule. That is a nodule within the lung. So with CT scans, I'm able to say this is what the liver or the bone or the uh, lung is supposed to look like, and then identify things that don't look normal in order to say this patient on the left has a lesion in their liver, the patient in the middle has lesions in their bones, and the patient on the right has a lesion that we can evaluate in their lungs. So CT scan works on density, and when the lesions are of a different density than the liver the, of the normal liver, the normal bone, or the normal lung, it allows us to see that lesions are exist and draw our attentions to those areas for us to evaluate whether malignancy is present. Uh, CT is very good at evaluating things like the liver, the bones, and the lung because of that. Now let's move on to magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. Magnetic resonance imaging works on magnetic field gradients. Now, MRI is not as good at some things as CT, like the bones and the lung, I really like to evaluate on CT. But these magnetic field gradients allow us to see soft tissues like the brain and the muscles better than we can evaluate on CT. So if you're really going for a good view of the brain, the MR or MRI or magnetic resonance imaging provides you the best imaging of the brain. On the left side of the image, you can see that there is an area that is very whitish. That is enhancement in a lesion inside this plate patient's skull, which is outlined as the outer portions of the image. Uh, and I'll show an image a little later that the CT doesn't show structures in the brain very well. The MR is far better for evaluating organs like the brain and the muscle. So that's anatomic imaging. Nuclear imaging, there are many different types of scans. Uh, nuclear imaging all uses small amounts of radioactivity, which are linked to molecules that go different places in your body. Let's start with bone scans. A bone scan is shown in the figure on the left. I show you a CT scan that goes with this patient on the right. Now, bone scans use a small amount of radioactivity linked to something that goes to bones that are remodeling. So important to note that on bone scans, you're not actually seeing the tumor, you're seeing the remodeling of the bone. Now, where malignancy exists in the bone, there's often a lot of remodeling, and therefore we can see bony malignancy by using a bone scan. But it's important to note that there are lots of other things that cause bone remodeling, and you'll also see those on bone scan. Thus, bone scans can detect lesions pretty well, but often detect a lot of other things that we don't want to see. Now, this is a patient with a malignancy, and let's take a look at the bone scan. We can see lots and lots of dark black areas. Those are areas that the bone scan has detected bony malignancy. Look over to the right, the bones on the CT scan look relatively normal with some small areas that tip you off that there's a, an abnormality. But in this case, the bone scan does a far better job of showing the extent of bony disease than the CT scan does. And this is, I think, the power of all the nuclear medicine or anatomic imaging modalities Often the nuclear medicine modalities are more sensitive at finding disease than CT or even MR. Now I'm gonna to go to the octreotide scan, which is crossed out. This was a molecular imaging method that was previously used for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. It targeted the somatostatin receptor, which is present on all neuroendocrine tumor cells. So if you looked back to that diagram, of the key fitting into the lock, the octreotide was the key that hit the lock, which was the somatostatin receptor. The somatostatin receptor is on the neuroendocrine tumors. But the octreotide scan has essentially been replaced now by dotatate PET scans. Dotatate PET scans are more sensitive, more specific. That means we find the disease earlier. We have fewer things that are not disease show up. 
it's faster, it has less radiation exposure, and it's less expensive. So for all measures, the dotatate scans are better than the octreotide scans. And I tell my referring clinicians, if they're ordering an octreotide scan, please don't. Please order one of the two types of dotatate scans, which we'll get to. So that is crossed out. These days, I don't think octreotide scans should be used. So let's move on now to positron emission tomography, or PET. And positron emission tomography is almost always performed these days as a combined PET CT with computed tomography in order to get anatomic information, or as a PET MR, again, to get anatomic information. So for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, we may perform a fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG, PET scan, or a dotatate PET scan. Let's take a look at what these two types of PET scans look like. On the left, we have a normal FDG scan. On the right, a normal dotatate scan. Note that they look different because these tracers go to different parts of the body. FDG is a sugar molecule labeled with a something called fluorine 18 that emits a small amount of radiation that we can see on a PET scanner. The FDG sugar molecule goes wherever sugar goes. So you can see up at the top of that image, that's the brain. Towards the bottom of the area is the bladder because this agent gets excreted in the urine, so you see it in the bladder. And in the middle, you can see the liver the spleen, and the kidneys. This image does not show any cancer. This is a normal FDG PET scan. Look over on the right to the normal dotatate PET scan. We see really dark areas that correspond with the spleen and the kidneys, and then down low, again, you can see that bladder because the, the, this agent is also excreted in the urine, so we often see the bladder where the agent has been excreted. Up higher, towards the top of the image, there's a single dot. That's the normal pituitary gland. And notice where the brain would be, there's no activity in the brain. The sugar molecule of FDG goes to the brain. The dotatate molecule doesn't go to the brain. The dotatate molecule finds somatostatin receptors. So it finds the somatostatin receptors in the spleen, in the kidneys, in the pituitary gland, and it will also find somatostatin receptors that are found in neuroendocrine tumors. And this patient doesn't have a neuroendocrine tumor. This is a, well, they had a neuroendocrine tumor, but the, the scan is normal. So there's no evidence of the tumor in this patient at this point in time. Just to show you what these normal scans are supposed to look like. Now we'll go and look at some abnormal scans so you can see what disease looks like on these scans. Here is a patient with a gastric neuroendocrine tumor. This patient undergoes one of these dotatate PET scans. Again, we can see the spleen, the kidneys, the bladder. There's an extra little area that's hot that's to the left of the spleen, and I'm gonna discuss that in a little more detail. If we look at the CT scan that shows the liver, and the stomach, and there's nothing abnormal. But when I impose, superimpose both the dotatate scan and the PET scan, I can see a really bright orange-red spot that corresponds to the stomach. And now if I look back over to the CT image, I can now see in retrospect this round mass that indeed is in the wall of the stomach. This is the neuroendocrine tumor of this patient in their stomach, and without the added value of the dotatate PET, it would be very, very hard to visualize this tumor in the patient's stomach. So again, look up into the upper right, our diagram, the neuroendocrine tumor expresses a target called the somatostatin receptor. Our binding agent called Tate binds to the somatostatin receptor. We have a linker called DOTA and a radioisotope, which in this case is the 68GA, the gallium 68. And this combined key, the gallium 68 dotatate PET scan, allows us to see that there's a neuroendocrine tumor in the stomach 
which is really missed on the anatomic CT scan without having the Dota PET scan to help you see where it is. This is a really great example of the power of dotatate scans. This is a patient who has known well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor or carcinoid. On the top, we see the FDG PET scan, which looks virtually normal. But take a look lower at the dotatate PET scan, superimposed over the CT scan, that shows there are foci in the bones, that are unfortunately osseous disease in the spinal canal, which is also disease. And then there's a nodule in the body wall, which is avid, that in retrospect, I can now go and see, oh yeah, there is a little nodule there on the CT scan. All of these foci are unfortunately sites of spread of neuroendocrine tumor that you can see on the dotatate scan, but you can't see on the FDG scan in this patient. So for patients with well-differentiated carcinoids, they tend to express the somatostatin receptor. So our molecular imaging agent, dotatate, works really well to see the tumor. On the upper part, the FDG is the sugar molecule, isn't well taken up in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. So it's easier in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors to see them on the dotatate than on the FDG. This may reverse when you talk about poorly differentiated tumors. Poorly differentiated tumors often lose their somatostatin receptors, so they no longer have the target that the dotatate can find. But those poorly differentiated tumors often become more hungry for sugar, and then you can see them on an FDG PET when you can't see them on a dotatate. So for each individual patient with a neuroendocrine tumor, we select the agents that are best for that individual patient based upon where we think their tumor is and whether the tumor is well or poorly differentiated. I showed you this patient earlier in the presentation when I was describing what MRs look like. This patient has a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and they undergo a dotatate PET scan. The MR showed that white lesion on the left side of the image. Notice that on the CT scan above the MR scan, we can't see that focus. We can't see it. So the MR was far better at seeing the lesion than the CT scan was. When we add the dotatate, now we can see that dark black spot in the top middle and the overlaid red orange spot on the far right demonstrating that this lesion uh, that we see on the MR is dotatate avid. Now this, I use this slide to make the statement, not everything that glitters is gold, right? We're looking to find tumor, but in this case, this is a dotatate PET scan that isn't finding tumor, but is actually finding something that is not tumor, what we call benign. This is a benign meningioma, not to be confused with a metastasis to the brain. And the MR probably does the best job of demonstrating that. When you see that white dot, you can see what we call tails along the edge of the dot that extend along the structure called the dura. It's extending up and extending down below the white dot. And that goes to show that this is not a brain metastasis, but rather is something growing on the dural surface of the brain and is a benign meningioma. So this is not a cancer. This is something that is benign and a good radiologist has to distinguish what is true cancer from something that is benign and can be mistaken for cancer. So here using the combination of the CT scan, the dotatate PET scan, the overlay of the CT with the dotatate PET, and the MR scan below, a good imager is able to say, ah, this is not cancer, this is a benign meningioma. And the goal of our of imagers is to get good enough is that we can interpret all of these different imaging modalities and by combining them, being able to best tell patients where their disease is 
and where it isn't. Now let's move on to a little bit more detail about dotatate scans. We showed a dotatate scan that was normal. We showed one that showed lots of sites of disease. And then we showed one that had uptake in something that was benign and needed to be distinguished from malignancy. Now, there are currently two different types of dotatate scans that are approved for imaging patients with neuroendocrine tumors. One is called gallium-68 dotatate. One is called the copper-64 dotatate. And I'm often asked, well, which one should I use? Well, I'll start with the bottom line, which is in the vast majority of cases, either will do just fine. But I will show a comparison of these two radiopharmaceuticals on a slide that I obtained from Dr. Eric Mitra from the Oregon Health and Sciences University. Again, I'm going to cross out the, the imaging agent on the left, which is the octreotide agent. We don't want to use that anymore. The agent on the right is the FDG PET scan that we want to use when we have poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And in the middle, we have a comparison of the two dotatate molecules. One is gallium-68 and one is copper-68. The first thing that I'll highlight is that the copper-68 molecule has what's called a longer half-life. Half-life is how long it takes for half the molecule to lose its radioactivity. So if I make a gallium dotatate molecule, in about an hour later, half of it is gone. And two hours later, three quarters of it is gone. And three hours later, seven eighths of it is gone. Whereas for copper dotatate, the much longer half-life allows me to have radioactive imaging agent for a much longer period of time. So if you're in a location where scheduling is difficult or your PET scanner, the PET scanner that you're using has technical issues, is, isn't always functioning properly, things happen. It is easier to use copper 64 dotatate than gallium 68 dotatate because if I use the gallium 68 dotatate and I have a delay of say three hours, virtually all of my imaging agent has disappeared. Whereas with copper 64, the imaging agent persists for one to two days. So it's very easy to schedule and utilize copper 64 dotatate in some instances, it may be harder to schedule and use gallium-68 dotatate. In a location that has multiple PET scanners where if one malfunctions, there's no problem, and their flow through of patients is very smooth, it won't make a difference. But in some instances, the gallium-68 dotatate can have more difficult scheduling issues. The second thing I'll talk about is the energy of the emissions from these two agents. And then the third thing is what's called the positron percent. And in the, for these two things, they help make the images better or not so good. And in, for one of them, gallium dotatate is better. And for the other, copper 64 is better. And they often kind of cancel each other out. So gallium 68 has a much higher positron percent, meaning for each molecule, you get more positrons. More positrons emitted mean more events that the PET scanner can detect and the more counts that the scanner gets in order to create good images. More positrons, better images, essentially. On the other side, the energy is better for the copper 64 dotatate. The energy of the positron is lower. Lower energy positrons travel a shorter distance before the uh, imaging event occurs. And therefore, we can more precisely localize where the positron is coming from with the copper 64 dotatate than with the gallium 68 dotatate, which has a higher energy and therefore a longer positron distance. And therefore, it's harder to more precisely note where the positron is coming from. So in one case, one imaging agent is better and in the other case, the other imaging agent is better. And now I'm going to show you these two imaging agents side by side. And essentially, it is very, very difficult to discern a difference between the two. So the normal gallium 68 dotatate is on the left, 
and the normal copper 64 dotatate is on the right. And in general, I find these images very, very comparable. So either one will do. There may be, with a trained eye, slightly more heterogeneity in the copper 64 dotatate. But for virtually any application, these two agents are equivalent. And whether you're getting a gallium 68 dotatate scan or a copper 64 dotatate scan, you can feel confident that the results will be very, very comparable. Now let's move beyond imaging and just briefly talk about molecular therapy. We said that gallium-68 or copper-64 dotatate allows us to make pictures that can image tumors. And here in the lower right is a gallium-68 dotatate picture. Remember we had this normal activity in the spleen, the kidneys, and the bladder. And now you can see that there are multiple dots on the left side of the image that are in the liver, and those are liver metastases. A patient like this may be able to benefit from a dotatate-targeted therapy, which is utilizes, instead of using gallium-68 or copper-64, uses lutetium-177, which is a much higher energy agent. So instead of having a little energy for us to image with, we get a lot of energy, enough to kill cancer cells. The mechanism is the same. The neuroendocrine tumors express the somatostatin receptor, which is a target. The dotatate is the binding agent that hits that target. But now instead of being linked to gallium-68, you're linked to lutetium-177, which emits a high energy beta particle and is able to kill neuroendocrine tumor cells. On the left, we see what's called a progression-free survival curve published from the Netter trial in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2017, showing that survival of patients uh, with metastatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors in this trial was much better with the treatment with the lutetium-177 dotatate, which is now known as Lutathera, than with the standard of care control arm. So we've taken the step from molecular imaging for us to see the tumor using the same mechanism. We're now treating the tumor using molecular therapy. For neuroendocrine tumors, the first and currently only molecular therapy that is FDA approved is lutetium-177 dotatate, now known as Lutathera. Let's briefly talk about radiology reports because I know all patients get these reports, and how do you interpret them? So I'll start from the upper left, and what the report will tell you what type of report it has. It usually then says clinical history, and then if there's a comparison study, it will say whether you're comparing to a study or you're not. It then tells you for a nuclear study, what is the agent that's administered? So this is where you'll see, ah, this study is a gallium-68 dotatate, or it's a copper 64 dotatate, or if it was a, a FDG scan, it will say F18 fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG. And if it's a bone scan, it will say 99M technetium bone scan agent. Okay? From there, it will tell you the technique that was used to image the patient. And usually it will just say for a nuclear study after administration of the agent, this is how the images were obtained. And then the finding section usually breaks down the body. There's different ways of doing this. Some is just full free text, but often they're broken down as head and brain, neck, chest, abdomen and pelvis, and then the bones, which are of course found in, in all the different areas. And in each of these sections, it will tell you what findings there are in each section. Now, in the upper right, I give you the typical narrative that you find in these sections. I won't read it all, but it typically reads something like hypermetabolic left axillary lymph node measuring this with a deeper left axillary lymph node measuring that, SUV this, and then it's enhanced in whatever. Very difficult to read. I like to teach to my trainees to simplify that language with eighth grade composition class to say, start with a topic sentence, which tells you what the answer is, 
and then give examples. So in this case, I would say I would like those sections to read axillary nodal metastases seen among fat. Here are the uh, uh, examples. Then when you read the section, you know, oops, there are axillary nodal metastases in the thoracic region, right? As opposed to trying to decipher what a, those big paragraphs often say. I hope as we evolve as physicians and radiologists that we'll get more to the point where speaking simpler language with topic sentences and examples rather than big paragraphs of information which are very difficult to decipher. Then at the end of the report, which is at the bottom right, is often labeled the impression. And the impression is usually a summary of the finding section listing hopefully the most important findings. In this patient, this impression says there is unfortunately multiple areas of malignancy involving bones, the liver, the lymph nodes, and the abdominal cavity. And then it says on a separate line, hey, there's also a focus in the thyroid gland, which probably isn't related to all this other stuff. And then it gives you a recommendation. An ultrasound could be used to evaluate this focus if you are interested. So that is the breakdown of where, what is in a radiology report. And on behalf of all of my radiology colleagues, I do apologize if some of the reports are very dense and difficult to break out what's the important stuff you should be looking at. And I hope we'll be moving towards a more topic sentence, this is what's important, and then here are a few examples beneath it. That is my presentation on uh, introduction to types of radiology scans and radiology reports for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. I work at the Hogue Family Cancer Institute. In the bottom left, there's a drawing showing that we are on Sam Canyon Avenue between the 405 and the 5. Very short drive from either the 405 and the 5. The upper left shows the outside of our building, which the parking lot is free and right in front. And to note that Hogue has often been exemplary uh, noted as one of the best hospitals by U.S. News and World Report and recognized as one of the 50 best uh, America's hospital uh, by health grades. In the bottom right, you can see our entryway to our molecular imaging and therapy clinic. That's a picture of our clinic coordinator, Beth Thompson, uh, manning uh, the front desk. And then in the bottom middle is a picture of uh, what our treatment rooms look like if you happen to be coming to Hogue. And this is a diagram of what our molecular imaging and therapy center looks like. Uh, we have a wing of the hospital with three treatment rooms and consult rooms highlighted in green, a hot lab in pink, which is where the radiopharmaceutical agents are received, quality analyzed and dispensed from, and then the all-important radioactive toilet highlighted in blue where only patients get to use. And those of us that work here in the clinic, we have to walk someplace else. So Hogue, we provide standard of care, molecular imaging and therapy, including Lutathera for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, Dotatate imaging for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, and Polarify and Plavicto imaging and therapy for patients with prostate cancer. And I and the clinic are involved in multiple different upcoming clinical research trials for patients with myeloma, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and immune treatments for cancer. Up and coming, I think within the next month or two, we will be activating an alpha therapy trial for patients who have neuroendocrine tumors that have progressed after receiving Lutathera, which is a beta therapy. There's a novel alpha therapy agent, which may work better than Lutathera, that we will have to offer to patients who have already had Lutathera, as well as a really exciting fibroblast activated protein targeted imaging and therapy for a number of different malignancies other than neuroendocrine tumors.
And if you have any questions about this presentation, about HOG, or about our Molecular Imaging and Therapy Center, please feel free to contact me. My name is Gary U. Lehner. I give you my email and phone number, or our clinic coordinator, Beth Thompson, and I give you her email and phone number. With that, I will thank you for your attention on this presentation about the radiology and radiology reports for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Best wishes and have a great evening. Welcome back, Dr. Ulaner, and thank you for that excellent presentation. What a wonderful overview of all the different types of scans and the report and what's applicable to this population. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and please do call me Gary. Okay. Um, well, we have many questions, as I mentioned to you, over 30 questions. So just to the audience, as you know, we cannot possibly get to them all, and we're not necessarily going to tackle them in the order that they were received. We're going to try to take them in an order that makes sense. So let's try to get to those questions now. Um, there's a lot of excellent questions, um, and let's start with this one. When the reports state numerous tumors throughout the liver, what does that mean? Does it mean more than 10 or more than 30? I do apologize, right? We are uh, sometimes uh, non-specific individuals. Uh, numerous means different to one person than to another. So in my reports, I like to say something like more than 10 or unfortunately you know, dozens or three, whatever it is. Um, but when someone says numerous, um, uh, uh, it is unfortunate one person numerous might be 10 and to another person numerous might be, be 30. So I'm afraid I cannot uh, say uh, what that in that particular instance is because I don't know the particular radiologist that, that dictated that report. I would say, again, in, in my dictations, I try not to say things like numerous. Um, I say more than 10 or three or dozens so that people have a better appreciation of uh, what uh, uh, extent of disease there is. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of questions um, sometimes about DOTA scans and also false positive in general. So are bone spots in a DOTA scan always net? And when, in effort, when if ever, would you suspect a bone lesion as a false positive? That's a really wonderful question because every test comes with false positives and false negatives. So uh, we have the advantage of almost every PET scan that is done these days is done as a PET CT or a PET MR. So we have the corresponding CT or MR images to help us evaluate individual lesions. Now, foci in the bone on a dotatate scan are often osseous metastases, but there are several benign etiologies of dotatate avidity in bones, particularly benign hemangiomas, benign fractures, and even sometimes degenerative changes. You can best evaluate whether a, a, a focus in the bone on a dotatate scan is malignancy or benign by, correspond, by looking at the corresponding CT or MR images. On a CT scan, we often see these, uh, what we call uh, uh, salt and pepper spots uh, in a lesion that we then say, ah, this, is, this looks like a benign hemangioma on, uh, on the CT scan, and then benign hemangiomas may be dotatate avid. So this is a common uh, benign finding uh, on, uh, on dotatate PET scans, these benign uh, osseous hemangiomas, these benign bone hemangiomas, uh, and they are avid, but then you, you, can, you can tell that they're benign by corresponding the dotatate PET scan with its CT scan that comes, that comes with it. So um, uh, to answer the question here, are bone lesions in a dotatate scan always neuroendocrine tumor? The answer is no. And then when do you suspect that a bone lesion is not cancer? You use the corresponding CT findings in order to say this is benign. Yeah, that's helpful. As you said in your presentation, not all that glitters, right? 
Um, not all that glitters yeah. is gold. Not all that is hot on a, on a PET scan is cancer. And if you might explain, because this comes up frequently and even on our support group, what is a hemangioma? Uh, gr great question. It is a, a, a benign malformation of, of blood vessels that sometimes occurs in the bone or sometimes occurs in the liver and sometimes occurs in other organs, like sometimes we see them in the, in the spleen. So it's just a collection of, of abnormal blood vessels, but it's not cancer. This is not going to grow. It's not going to metastasize. Uh, and in general, it doesn't cause the patient any problems. And they have very characteristic appearances on CT and uh, MR. Um, so again, being able to read both the dotatate PET as well as the corresponding anatomic imaging uh, w w makes for a better comprehensive read of the study. Ah, thanks for that explanation. And, you know, uh, we just talked about bones. When might you use bone scans for net? Uncommonly, I would say these days, with the availability of dotatate PET scans, um, I very rarely will order a bone scan for a patient with a with a neuroendocrine tumor. In fact, I cannot recall either when I personally have ordered one um, or when I've when I've read one. <laughs> it's been quite a long time. Um, so, with the availability of Dotatate PET CT, I don't think bone scans are are uh, are 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 the 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 pinnacle of available imaging imaging technology. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of interest, of course, in dotatate PETs. How often should patients in active surveillance be getting dotatate PET CTs? That question depends upon who's answering the question. Um, you know, for a lot of, for some physicians, the answer is neg never, and for some physicians, they make up their own schedules. For patients in surveillance, meaning you you have no evidence of active malignancy. The National Comprehensive Com uh, Cancer Network guidelines don't say we should be doing imaging uh, 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 for this for tr for surveillance, which truly means the patient has no no known disease, and you're only looking for uh, for for recurrence. Um, so uh, uh, often the answer is we don't. Um, some physicians like to perform annual uh, uh, scans, and uh, to me. Uh, one of the the big uh, um, clues to me that a scan is going uh, is highly likely to be negative uh, is that if I look at the prior scan was uh, December fifteen uh, December oh, excuse me well, today is a uh, uh, September fifteenth twenty twenty one and it was negative and the patient's getting a scan on. Uh, September 15, 2022, that's probably one of these annual surveillance scans and, and uh, the chance of finding diseases will be incredibly low. Yeah, thanks for that. And, you know, another question about dotate scans and comparing to other scans, is MRI better than dotate, the Gallium 68 PET dotate to identify any liver nets or should both be done? especially in active surveillance? Great, great question. Um, there's a difference between sensitivity, how, ca how, how, uh, how, ca how good are you at detecting the cancers, and specificity, which is how good are you at determining that the, it's treated or um, it, is, it, it isn't a cancer. So at initial diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor, um, if there's any suspicion of liver disease, I like the liver MR. The liver MR has the sensitivity to pick up really, really small liver metastases. Um, once a patient receives treatment, it's often hard for the MR to determine what is still active disease and what is treated disease then the dotatate, whether it's gallium-68 or copper-64, scans become uh, the most specific uh, test for evaluating whether there is residual disease. So uh, at initial diagnosis, I, I never complain about having a liver MR for increased sensitivity in the liver. And then in follow-up of disease, uh, I'm, uh, 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 I favor the, the, the dotatate PET scans. Um, as, as we just said, the MR may have difficult determining what's active and what's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, you already answered, um, addressed some of this already. If someone already had 
a gallium dotate at diagnosis, would you recommend being consistent with the same scan versus copper dotate uh, during active surveillance? I think these agents, yeah, gallium versus copper, um, as we as we discussed, there are some advantages to gallium and some advantages to copper, and I think it all comes out in the wash. Uh, I'm happy with with either of them. I think either the gallium dotate or the copper dotate remains the gold standard um, for imaging um, uh, neuroendocrine uh, disease. Um, uh, and if you had a gallium and the center that you're at says, well, we're doing copper today, uh, I don't think there's a, there's a, a, a problem uh, with that, nor do I think there's a problem with that if you had a copper and then they say, oh, we're doing a gallium today. Uh, I, I think I, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, you should be uh, uh, very satisfied with either one that doesn't translate to all studies. So like if you have a CT, uh, the MR is not equivalent. Um, there's a big difference between a CT and an MR. So if you're getting CTs for follow-up, if you get an MR and you start finding little things in the liver, um, it's hard to tell are those new or uh, um, uh, are those just little things that weren't seen on the CT scan. So between the two dotate scans, I think they're essentially equal. Um, but other imaging modalities like CT versus MR are definitely not equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. And, you know, this is an excellent question. Basically, where does the gallium dotate cover? Is it from the vertex to the legs or the base of the skull to the legs? How much does it cover of the uh, body? The PET scan covers the amount of the body that the, uh, uh, the, the, the hospital and the team at the hospital covers. Um, so for a a neuroendocrine tumor that occurs in the chest, abdomen, or pelvis, I think it's very, very reasonable to do a scan that goes from the vertex um, uh, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, mid-thigh. Um, uh, uh, because you're not, it, it, the, there's not much background activity in the brain, so you can visualize the entire brain and just make sure there's no problem uh, in the brain. But that isn't to say that some places don't start at the base of skull because other tests like the FDG PET scan, which has lots of physiologic background in the brain, so it's not as valuable for eval evaluating the brain, they tend to start at the, at the base of skull. So a lot of places, you know, just because it's, it's uh, uh, in, ingrained that the FDG PET start at the base of the skull, the dotate scan start at the base of the skull. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, when I protocol, um, I, I have them go from the, from the top of the skull um, uh, into the mid thigh um, uh, in order to take advantage of the fact that the dotate doesn't have a problem with brain background. Ah, so it's institution dependent. And where would that show up to know if someone was wondering if it covers in, the whole well, brain or not? If you're if you're reading your 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 report in the in the technique section, it will say from the from the skull base to the mid thigh, or it will say from the top of the skull to the feet. Um, they will give you the field of view in the in the uh, technique section, and then when you're looking at the images, then you can see whether the entire head is included or not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, here's another question about. PET scans. What does PET CT with contrast mean? And are there different types of contrast and what are they called? Are gallium or dotate contrast mediums? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, gallium, um, the, the, the dotate, whether it's gallium dotate or copper dotate, is usually not called contrast. It's called a radio tracer, right? That's the, the molecule that the PET scanner uh, uses to find where the molecule goes. Um, so those are usually, they, they, if they're called contrast, I think that's a mistake. I think that should be called the radio tracer. Contrast is really, is a material that is either ingested, that's oral contrast, or it injected into the vein, that's intravenous contrast, in order to help with the visualization of the CT scans. Oral contrast can outline the gastrointestinal tract, and intravenous contrast can show you the blood vessels and enhancement in the soft tissues, which makes detection of lesions in the liver um, 
spleen, kidneys, uh, much easier. So contrast, you'll see, it will tell you, it says either oral, sometimes they say PO, which is kind of the medical jargon for oral contrast, which means like per orum in, in Latin, um, or intravenous or IV contrast. Um, that means you received something to drink, that's the oral, or they administered contrast into your vein, that's the intravenous, and that's part of the, the CT scan, not Real, not part of the, the, the dotatate PET scan. Thank you for that. Could a lymph node with the SUV of 3.4 on a dotatate be a false positive? Is there an SUV range that could signify false po positivity? Numbers, yeah. uh, I think people get hung up right yeah, on the numbers. Could a lymph node with the SUV of 3.4 be a false positive? Absolutely. Do I want to give a number where I say this is where false positives are? No, I, I actually no, um, uh, because uh, you, you can have uh, malignancy that is very, very low avidity and malignancy that's very, very high malignancy high SUV, so low SUV to high SUV. And then you can have benign things, like for example, we just talked about hemangiomas, which also can be very, very low, and other benign things uh, can be very, very high. So the, the, there's considerable overlap in these numbers between what is the number for a, for a malignant lesion and what's the number for a benign lesion. So looking at the number itself, you can't tell whether a lesion is um, uh, benign or malignant. And there's no like cutoff, oh, these are malignant and then these are, are benign. You, you need to use the, both the, the, the PET images as well as the corresponding CT findings. Again, if something is SUV 12 or 20, but I in the bone, but then I look at the CT and I say, this is a hemangioma, that's a benign hemangioma. Whereas if I uh, look at uh, another area in the exact same patient, and there's a round focus of avidity that might only be six, but there's no corresponding CT abnormality to say that this is benign, I'm going to call that very suspicious for being malignant, even though it's SUV value, the number is lower than something that I said is is benign. So uh, to answer the question, could a lymph node SUV 3.4 be a false positive? Yes. And is there a range that could signify? I try not to give a, a range. Yeah, it sounds like there's nuances to this. There's art yeah. into the science. Yes, we need both. Um, so is an MRI better than a dotatate PET scan in detecting and monitoring pancreatic nets, which has been met met uh, metastasized to the bone and para para aortic lymph nodes? Um, uh, we touched on this already. Um, different organs are better and uh, 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 on different imaging modalities. And then again, initial um, anatomic imaging tends to be better than follow-ups where it's harder to distinguish uh, active from treated disease. So you have that detecting slash monitoring are two different scenarios. Um, in the, pan the pancreas, the MR may be able to uh, help localize lesions and uh, show you complications of lesions like pancreatic duct obstruction um, that the dotatate PET uh, uh, cannot. Um, uh, in general, I still favor whole body, meaning, you know, from the vertex to the mid thigh, PET CT scans with dotatate. And then if I need to look at the pancreas or the liver, I get an MR specific to that organ. So uh, while some people do PET MRs for dotatate, I'm still in the, in the camp of PET CT uh, is easier, uh, quicker, um, patients don't have to be on the scanner for an hour uh, or, or, you know, very long time like they do for a PET MR. So I would rather get a PET CT, dotatate PET CT you know, for the whole body. And then I rely on the MR for individual organs if I need further evaluation. And then if you're comparing like just the, the MR to the PET, um, again, at initial diagnosis, the MR 
often has higher sensitivity, particularly for small lesions. And then at follow-up, the Dota PET has better specificity for determining whether disease is active or treated. Yeah, okay, thank you for that very clear answer. Um, is it common to use Dotatate and FDG PET to rule out whether a grade two, one or two net has progressed to grade three? This is used a lot in lymphoma, like low grade to high grade lymphoma. If you have a low grade lymphoma that isn't being treated, um, uh, there's something called transformation to higher grade lymphoma. And then physicians will order PET scans. They know the lymphoma is there. And what they're really interested in is did the tumor um, uh, become much, much more FDG avid, which is a, a good sign that a low grade lymphoma has turned into or transformed into a high grade lymphoma, which would need more intensive uh, therapy. Um, I haven't uh, um, uh, seen this as commonly utilized in, in neuroendocrine tumors because it's usually not such a sharp switch in neuroendocrine tumors where it goes it was low grade, you know, three months ago, and all of a sudden you find high grade disease now. Um, with neuroendocrine tumors, you tend to see a, a more slow progression of the tumor from, from lower grade to higher grade. Um, so I don't see many people ordering dotatate um, uh, or FDG scans um, to say, hey, has the tumor transformed, changed from a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor to a, to, to a high-grade uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor. Okay, thank you for that answer. And this is an interesting question. If a PET CT shows your heart to be normal, you still need an echocardiogram to check for carcinoid heart disease. Um, that's a great question. Uh, let's talk about PET CT. Remember, there are different types of radio tracers: FDG versus dotatate, and then there are many others. An FDG scan, the myocardium of the heart has normal physiologic activity, so it can be very difficult to distinguish normal avidity on an FDG PET from abnormalities. And it's so common to have normal activity in the heart that most people, um, it is, let's just say it's uncommon for us to be saying, hey, um, we're pretty sure there's a metastasis here in the heart. So if you're worried about cardiac sarcoid and you're talking about an FDG PET, um, uh, absolutely, the, the uh, dedicated cardiac imaging like an echocardiogram um, will be better than, than FDG PET. On a dotatate uh, PET scan, you don't see so much physiologic activity in the heart. Therefore, when you see foci in the heart, it is, it is suspicious. Um, very similar to what we discussed with um, uh, uh, you know, MRs of the liver or MRs of the pancreas, an echocardiogram of the heart, when you're looking just at the heart, you can be more sensitive with the echo for picking up smaller lesions. Um, but again, that only evaluates one organ, uh, whereas the PET scan gives you a more comprehensive evaluation, whole body evaluation. Yeah, thank you for that. And I know that you, we talked quite a bit about Dotate and when they should be repeated. Particularly, how, what about after post-surgical removal of the tumor? So how often should a Dotate be per performed post-surgical removal of the tumor of the pancreas, like a Whipple, as surveillance in which I think, the primary net was I, I think we answered this uh, a little earlier. This is the question of how often should I be doing imaging in surveillance? And again, we'll define surveillance as there's no evidence of disease, and then you're just looking to see if disease recurs. And many people and the, and the NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, say we should not be doing surveillance imaging at all. And then other people say, well, I'm going to go get that annual scan. Um, uh, 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 to see if, uh, if recurrences uh, uh, occur, did occur. Um, I don't have a, a, a right answer uh, uh, to the question other than to say that different people do different things. Yes. And another, I mean, multiple questions on this, but how frequently do you think scans are necessary for unreserved low-grade disease? And is a CT worth doing or just wait for the yearly MRI? same the same issue if again once you have you're down to the point where there's no detectable disease 
um, you're at that point of, of surveillance imaging. And there's no data that says that by doing surveillance imaging, for example, if you do like an annual scan or a scan every six months, there's no data that says that if I detect the disease earlier on that surveillance scan, as opposed to waiting for something else to happen, um, that outcomes are, are any better. Um, uh, so some people say don't do them and some people choose a interval in, in, in which they do them. And this, isn't, this is not an issue that is unique to neuroendocrine tumors. The same thing can be said with lymphoma and breast cancer. Um, uh, we get these annual uh, surveillance scans on patients with lymphoma because their disease was treated five years ago successfully treated and there's been no disease for five years now, but they get a scan every year and then we just give out a report that says uh, still no cancer. Okay, thank you for that. And this is an interesting question. Is the term stable for lung nodules suspected of being NETS or do they use stable when the nodule is under surveillance and can they disappear? Let's go. The word stable is usually a good thing. Uh, there are lots of things in the body that are that are there um, that aren't cancer. Lung nodules, uh, low attenuation lesions in the liver and the kidneys, um, a, a, a plural, some pleural thickening, um, uh, uh, adnexal cysts. Um, uh, these things, our body just tends to accumulate uh, uh, tiny abnormalities uh, as we age, uh, and they don't have clinical significance. So to me, when they say the word stable to one of these more incidental findings like tiny little lung nodules, to me that is a reassuring word. Now, the word stable can be um, uh, there's some, there's some uh, confusion, or, or I should say some conflict with the word, because then there's also a system of measuring disease response called RESIST, um, response criteria in solid tumors, and abbreviated as RESIST. And there, the categories are complete response, partial response, stable disease, and progressive disease. So when you're using rhesus and you say that disease is stable, um, uh, that could mean that you're happy, the disease hasn't gotten worse, or it could mean you're unhappy, the disease hasn't responded to therapy. So uh, mm -hmm. it depends what people are using the term stable on. If it's these incidental findings like two millimeter, three millimeter lung nodules or renal cysts or lung um, cysts or liver cysts, the word stable is a good thing. It means it's there, it's probably been there, and it's probably going to continue to be there for a long time. When someone says cancer is stable, um, uh, that depends upon whether you were actually trying to shrink the tumor at, with treatment at the time or not, right? If a low-grade lymphoma um, or a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor that is not undergoing treatment is stable in size, that's a good thing, it's not growing. If a, um, uh, you know, if a, if a poorly differentiated tumor that's under multiple, line, uh, multiple forms of therapy, systemic and radiation therapy, if we say that is stable, that's probably a bad thing because you wanted that thing to shrink or disappear. Yes, thank you. And there were a couple questions along these lines. Would a two, would two ileocecal lymph nodes being up to five millimeters be of any concern? This person particularly had a lung net removed in April and currently has no evidence of disease. For that, that for that, in this particular example, with a a tumor that was originally in the chest, and you're talking about nodes down in the pelvis, those are almost certainly benign, and it is not uncommon to get lymph nodes in that ileocolic uh, region, um, for whatever reason, it's some kind of inflammatory process. Um, and five millimeters is a small lymph node. So for someone who has a lung malignancy, uh, malignancy in the lung, to have sub-centimeter ileocolic nodes, those are almost certainly benign. Thank you. 
Um, what is, or how is a CT chest with contrast or without contrast different for nets? Each organ is a little different. So the lung, you don't need the contrast because you can see the lung nodules really well on a non-contrast CT um, uh, because the normal lung is mostly gas, um, whereas the nodule is a solid nodule. So to evaluate on a CT chest, we see the lung, the heart, the mediastinum, vessels, the thymus. We see multiple different organs on a CT chest. So for the lung, you can do a non-contrast or a contrast enhanced CT. They're virtually uh, um, uh, equivalent. But for other structures like the mediastinal lymph nodes, uh, having contrast is a definite advantage. So if you're just looking at lung nodules, you can do that without contrast. If you're worried about mediastinal lymph nodes or other organs in the mediastinum, then contrast is really preferred. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, can the appearance of a lung metastasis from rectal primary appear as ground glass opacity? Anything can appear like any, uh, unfortunately, like anything. Does it usually happen? No. Um, rectal tumors, uh, colon tumors normally produce rounded, solid uh, uh, lesions. There are incidental examples of where someone had a ground glass opacity and it turned out to be metastatic from a rectal primary, but that is not the common, um, uh, 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 what usually occurs. Um, uh, so when I see a ground glass opacity, um, I'm not dictating suspicious for rectal cancer metastasis. Um, a ground glass opacity um, uh, will, will almost always fall into either something infectious inflammatory and, and thus benign, or ground glass opacities can also represent low-grade primary lung malignancies. Um, uh, that often don't need to be immediately evaluated because it takes them a long, long time for them to grow into something dangerous, which is why you tend to get reports that say something like, you know, six-month follow-up imaging or attention on follow-up because they want to make sure that ground glass opacity disappears and was nothing to worry about and isn't some low-grade lung cancer that you don't have to worry about now but could grow into trouble later. Thanks for that. I know this question has come up frequently in our support groups and such. Um, what's the best imaging for numerous liver tumors with unknown primary? And are there are different types better depending on tumor location? Uh, great question. That's a great question. And it's a great question because people still fight over it. <laughs> um, uh, and it really comes down to the definition of unknown primary. Um, obviously, unknown primary means you don't know where the, where the primary tumor is, but what what have you done before to work up where is the location of the tumor? So for example, I could have a lymph node in my neck and that gets biopsied. And then they say, this is a cancer in my ne neck node of unknown primary. Um, that's a little different than the situation where you did the same thing. We biopsied that same neck node and we got cancer. And then they did a scope. Right? They looked into, your, into the pharynx as far as they could, and they don't see the cancer. And they did an, a CT of the neck, and they did an MR of the neck, um, uh, and they can't find uh, the lesion. And then they say, okay, this is an unknown primary. So um, uh, it, you know, how much workup has there been already? Um, so the one best imaging type pretty much depends upon what has been done previously. If I have a neck nodal metastasis, um, I might go get a CT or an MR of the neck next because that's likely to show me where the primary is. And then if I don't see it on the CT or the MR, then I might get an FDG PET um, because it's been shown that in about a third to a half of instances, the FDG PET will find the site of disease that is missed on CT or MR. So for patients for neuroendocrine tumor, let's say you have liver metastases and you don't know where the primary is, often the first thing that's done is a 
um, a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to see if you can locate where that primary, uh, where the primary tumor is that caused the liver metastases. And if you can't find it um, uh, on the CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a neuroendocrine tumor, you might do a dotatate PET scan next. Um, and if it's something else, like if you, it was a, a, an adenocarcinoma, then they might do an FDG PET next. Um, because in both cases, again, sometimes lesions that are missed on uh, the anatomic imaging can be picked up on uh, the PET scans. Um, so what is the next, what is the best imaging modality it depends upon what's been already done before. Yeah, thank you for that. That was really helpful. And what about, you know, kind of shifting gears, what's the most readable and best scan for neck paraganglioma, CT PET or MRI? Uh, so uh, let's, let's break the paraganglioma into something that's thought to be a benign paraganglioma versus a malignant para paraganglioma. For a benign um, a paraganglioma that you're worried about its encroachment on local structures. I think that MR neck is uh, the mo is the best imaging modality to give you anatomic information about what's going on with the paraganglioma and the local uh, uh, the structures that are that are right next to it. But then again, a small percentage of paragangliomas are metastatic. Um, and in that case, a uh, the paragangliomas are often dotatate. AVID. Uh, so a dotatate PET scan may be performed in order to uh, first determine if the paraganglioma in the neck is AVID. Um, and if it's AVID, then to evaluate whether there are any other foci in the body that could represent paragang uh, you know, other benign gangliomas, metastases from an, a, a, a less common malignant paraganglioma, or if there are any other neuroendocrine tumors in a patient, because the, uh, like wolves, these things tend to run in packs. So once you have one neuroendocrine tumor, benign or malignant, you are at higher risk for developing another one. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a good question about MRIs. I don't know if we've covered this already. What are the different contrast agents used in MRI? And what are their utility in different nets for surveillance? It's very similar. It's not, this is not specific to, to neuroendocrine tumors, but for all cancers. There are contrast agents that are, um, and uh, we won't go into all the different names, but they kind of come in two different flavors. One is a contrast agent that enhances uh, the, uh, um, uh, allows you to see the vasculature so you can see the soft tissue. And then the other, the other type is the, the contrast that gets picked up in normal liver parenchyma. Um, uh, uh, there are these, and then there's, you know, uh, Gativist, Magnavist, they're all different agents. But as I like to say, hey, there's the one that enhances vessels, and then the one that on delayed imaging gets picked up in the liver uh, cells, the normal liver cells. And if you're looking for, uh, tumors, metastases in the liver, the uh, forms of contrast that get picked up in the liver cells, the hepatocytes on delayed imaging, I think have a slight advantage over the type that don't, that only enhance the vessels. Because if you do have uptake lesion, then you can say, ah, this is probably benign um, uh, 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 liver cells, not a, a tumor in the liver, whereas uh, uh, the, the lack of contrast enhancement on those delayed images then point you more towards, oops, this is not supposed to be here in the liver. This could be a liver metastasis. So yet for tumors, um, uh, uh, using a, a, a contrast agent where there is delayed phase uptake in normal liver uh, hepatocyte cells, um, that has shown to have a slight advantage over types of MR contrast that don't. Yeah, thank you, that's important. Um, and I know this question comes up as well in our groups. Um, what does post-surgical changes mean on radiology reports? Is this interpretation, um, there could be mask local recurrences. That's exact, exactly what the radiologist is try, trying to do. Uh, I can't stand up and, and pat my own butt, uh, but that's what they're, they're covering their, their, their butt. They're saying, hey, there's, the, there's these changes because of the surgery 
and there are always going to be changes because of these sur because of the surgery. And now, if they see something that they think is suspicious for occurrence, they're not going to call it post-surgical changes. They're going to say oh, there's something here that's suspicious for occurrence. But by saying post-surgical changes, um, when you if if it, it, it you know six months later there is a recurrence. Uh, you go back into the same area, you can say, hey, I, could, I didn't see the recurrence six months earlier. It could have been masked in these post-surgical changes. Um, mm. The same thing could be done for radiation changes in the lung. Um, you can say post-radiation changes, and that's just trying to, to, to say, hey, this is not normal lung, but I, I don't see anything that's suspicious for tumor at this point in time. Yeah. Wow. This person asked a question that is a perfect segue. Um, do you see any benefit in having a radiologist review or compare all the CT scans since diagnosis, like say three years with a focus on disease progression, say in the liver? I'll expand that. Is there advantage to having comparison images? Yes, yes, and yes. Now, do, do, you, have to, do you have to review all comparison images? That depends on, on individual lesions. Um, if, if I have a, a five millimeter lung nodule and I look back to one scan three years ago and it looks exactly the same, that is almost certainly a benign lung nodule. Lung nodules that are, that are malignant don't usually stay the same for three years. Um, but then, you know, you could have a, a tiny uh, lymph node and if you look at it, on, uh, let, well, I'm going to choose years here. Let's say we look at it in 2022 and it's 10 millimeters. And you looked at it at 2021 and it was nine millimeters. Um, and you go, oh, it's stable. But if you went back and looked at 2019 and it was six millimeters, well, now you could see that it's, that it's growing. I've heard this described as the stable, 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 whoops phenomenon, where when you compare any two scans, it looks stable because the changes are so small. But when you go back over multiple scans, you can see, oops, the lesion has truly changed. So for me, for things like lung nodules, if I go back and look at a three-year-old scan and, it, and it's unchanged, I'm just calling it benign. Uh, for a, a, a lymph node, if there's any small increase from the prior, I might look at another prior, right? So the number of priors I look at will depend on the individual um, uh, uh, situation. But, but the, the overwhelming, um, the, the real big picture here is that you should have, as, you should have at least one, one prior. Um, uh, it's very common, not just for neuroendocrine tumors, but for virtually every malignancy. Patients get their scan at one hospital, um, or they get five years of scans at one hospital, and then they transfer their care to a new hospital, and I get a new scan, and then I look at a lesion, and I say, I can't tell for sure if this is benign or malignant, but if I had all the scans from the other hospital, I would be able to do so. So if you're moving from one place to another, please try and provide prior images to the new institution that's going to be giving you uh, an interpretation of your images. Having prior images makes a big difference in how certain you can be in calling something benign. Yeah, thanks for that practical message, and that's really important. I know we always tell patients to have copies, not just of the reports, but also the CDs so that they can bring with them. Yeah, the, 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 the actual images you want so okay. that I can, I can say this is what is today and this is what is six months ago or 12 months ago or two years ago. The actual images. Um, and so looking to the future, in a note from my cancer center, they stated they are using AI to preview scans. And if changes are detected, these are given higher priority. How does AI work? You got me. I have no idea. Um, no, literally, I, I am not an AI person. Um, uh, so this is beyond my area of expertise. Um, I can give you a general overview from having sat through one or two, you know, introductory lectures on on how how computers do this. But to be perfectly honest, I have no idea. Um, I will say that AI is, is moving into 
uh, radiology. Um, and there are those that have said, um, you know, in 10 years, we won't need radiologists because ra ra uh, AI is going gonna, is gonna to do the job. Um, to that, I will say, people said that 10 years ago, and yet here I still am sitting in the reading room right now interpreting uh, PET CT scans. So uh, in, in my best guess, I'm going to say that AI is not going to replace radiologists, but radiologists that use AI are going to replace radiologists that don't use AI because the AI will continually get better and better, and the little things that AI currently does better than the radiologist, uh, the human, um, uh, we should be incorporating into our, our re uh, the way we do our reads. And as the computers get better and better and better, then there's going to be more and more and more of that. Mm, thank you. That's helpful. And we'll take this as a last question before just your closing thoughts and comments. Is it important to take into account the amount of radiation emitted from CTs over one's lifetime? For example, a young patient who has many in their future. This is a great question, a really great question, because this concept of radiation is discussed over uh, uh, again. I'm going to break this up into benign disease and malignant disease, all right? Because every medical test that you get, like a CT scan or a PET scan, MRs don't, don't have radiation exposure. But CTs and PET scans, every single scan has a small amount of radioactivity. So if you get one, you get one unit of that radioactivity. And if you get 30 of them, you have 30 units, right? Each one you get, you get a small amount of radioactivity. But in reality, that amount of radi radi radiation is incredibly small. So if you have, uh, like if you have kidney stones and you know you have kidney stones and every time you have a, a pain in your side, you go and get a CT scan, well, you end up with, 30 CT scans worth of radiation when you, you kind of knew you had kidney stones and you don't need that. Um, but when you have malignant disease, the same 30 units of radiation means a lot less overall in your life um, uh, for multiple reasons. One, you need the information on as to whether your tumor is getting bigger or smaller to make treatment decisions a lot more than you do to keep saying, yes, it's a kidney stone, yes, it's a kidney stone, yes, it's a kidney stone. So just that, the, the value you get out of how to manage your therapy is much greater than the tiny amount of radiation that you're getting from any diagnostic scan. And then I'll throw on that many patients with malignancies get radiation therapy. Right? That radiation therapy is a million to 10 million times more radiation than a diagnostic scan, literally a million times as much. So when patients who have had radiation therapy come and ask, well, does it, I've already had this radiation, does the scan make a difference? I tell them it's like adding a drop of water to an Olympic sized swimming pool. It just at that point doesn't make any difference. So to me, if you need an answer on your cancer, get the scan. The answer to how it affects your, your management is far, far, far more important than the tiny amount of radiation that you're going to uh, 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 get from the scan. But on the flip side, if you don't need the scan, uh, don't get the scan. That's really comforting. Thank you for that. And I'll just end with this last question. What final thoughts or words of encouragement do you have for the NET community? And perhaps what future developments are you most excited about? I'm excited about the potential of alpha therapy um, that might be a step beyond the beta therapy that comes with, uh, with Ludothera. Um, uh, neuroendocrine tumors had this huge leap forward um, with the uh, uh, FDA approval of, uh, of Ludothera. Um, uh, and we're all looking for where that next huge leap forward is going to come from. Uh, I don't know if it's going to come from alpha therapy, uh, but I certainly think it's, it's worthwhile uh, for the investigation. And then another potential uh, area uh, for, for targeted imaging and therapy will be um, uh, uh, the evaluation of more specific binding 
uh, to those somatostatin receptors, which are the hallmark of neuroendocrine tumors. If you have agents that people are constantly working on the development of new agents that have higher uh, um, specific binding um, uh, to uh, so the somatostatin receptor, and a marked advance improvement there will translate into marked improvements in imaging and therapy. Thank you. We're really excited and looking forward to all that comes will be coming in the future as well. Thank you for all you do for the net community. We're really excited to have you um, join us today and just jo join the net family here in Southern California. It's a real great pleasure to be here and thank you for um, you know, shining a light on an important issue. Thank you very much. And now I'm gonna go back to Lindsay in the studio. Thank you so much, Dr. Ulaner and Lisa. Be sure you're following LACNETs on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. And now I'll pass it back to you, Lisa. Thanks, Lindsay. We offer many programs and resources, including our weekly virtual net support group, a dedicated monthly virtual caregiver only support group, Net Vitals, which is a downloadable patient physician communication tool to help you prepare for your medical appointments, and Health Coaching, which is available to net patients or caregivers. We encourage you to go to our website, lacnets.org, to find out more information about our programs, view resources, read blogs, take net quizzes, and much, much more. LACNETS has developed a couple tools to help patients and caregivers learn to speak net. In 2018, we developed Net Vitals with the help of Dr. Dan Lee from City of Hope. Net Vitals is a patient physician communication tool to help you prepare for your medical appointments by filling it out as a self assessment tool to give you the opportunity to look some things up before your appointments and highlight the questions you have for your net expert. It also helps you organize all the vital information about your net in one document. This year, we developed an abbreviated net intro tool as a quick way for you to share your net history with someone who needs to understand the key pieces of information about your net tumor. Your net intro includes the first page of net vitals. We found it's useful when you see a net expert at an appointment or conference. So instead of taking 15 minutes to tell your story, you can bottom line the critical pieces they need to know about your disease in just two sentences and then be able to move on to your question. It's also useful in support groups as it allows us to be more efficient in our introductions and allow more time for networking. Go to our website for detailed instructions on how to build your net intro. We've created a printable wallet size card that you can fill out and carry with you and have handy. So you can then pull out your net intro card and read your two sentence net intro to your medical providers. And we encourage you to practice with other net patients or caregivers or in your support groups. Net Intro is also available on our website in Spanish. Did you know that LACNETS has a podcast featuring net experts who answer the top 10 questions in their field? We release one episode every month. We hope you'll take a listen. If you registered for today's webinar, you will receive an email to fill out a survey. We would really appreciate it if you take the time to fill it out as the survey results help us with our fundraising and support and for planning for future events. Thank you again to our special guest for today, Dr. Gary Ulaner. We're grateful for all you do for the NET community. Thank you to Rich at TVP Live and to all of you for joining us today. Goodbye and see you next month.